an administrator has a ministerial duty to perform. Okay, so now look up the word ministerial. Ministerial duty. Ministerial. It has a ministerial duty to perform. That was the word I was trying to think of, not administrator. The administrator has a ministerial duty to perform. So ministerial. That which is not opposed to judicial, that which involves obedience to instructions but demands no special discretion, judgment, or skill. Exactly. Now, you see, that's what an, that defines an administrator. They don't have no discretion, judgment, or skill. And that's why they'll tell you they're following somebody's directing them to do something, which is the legislature. The legis- That's why if you look in a judicial hearing on TV, I watch all this stuff. You'll have Congress, some senators up there grilling a judge. Why were you doing this? They're grilling, they're grilling administrative law judges because they're their employees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, judge uh, Kraftscher, I'm going to read you a quote. You tell me whether or not you know who said this, okay? A hundred percent of the women at call centers have been abused. It's an atmosphere of abuse. Anytime we see a call center person, female, all have been abused. Do you know who said that, Judge? I did, but it's taken out of context. Well, sir, your, um, microphone, your microphone, can you repeat that, sir? Yes. He said it was taken out of context. Well, let's put that in context, uh, Judge. Was that, was that, did somebody testify to that at a lower level? Was that in the record? No, sir, that was my experience. Did you rely on a learned treatise? I, you, made a, you made a point of saying in your opening statement how much respect you pay to the federal rules and the Constitution. W- was that a learned treatise you relied upon, Judge? No, that was my experience o- over, over time. So you years. made yourself a witness, even though the federal rules are very clear that judges are not witnesses. Is that what your testimony is, Judge? That was my opinion. Not, not any, that was my opinion. A hundred percent of female employees at call centers have been abused. I didn't say that. A hundred percent of the people that appeared before me have been abused. And, and, and you relied on no learned treatise, no testimony at a lower level, just your innate sense of medicine? No, that's been my experience of having hearings. Well, let me ask you about another one of your experiences, Judge. I, I want to read you another quote and, you, and, and ask you whether or not you recognize who said this, okay? Mm-hmm. How did your family discipline you? Did they hit you on the butt? I'm starting to do some analysis. It's starting to be when women are hit at an early age, they start developing problems in their 20s, late teens and 20s. My ex-wife told me about this. There's something in a girl that's a sexual thing. It arouses certain things. Did you say that, Judge? Yes, I did. Basically. Did you rely upon a learned treatise in reaching that determination? No, I lied. Did you rely on something at a lower level, a hearing, a witness testified to that? No, I relied on my experience hearing case over 20 years. Uh, Judge, I hasten to add, because you made a point of saying in your opening statement that your first responsibility is to the Constitution and the federal rules of evidence. Are you aware that judges can't be witnesses? Are you familiar with that, Judge? I don't consider myself a witness. You just testified to your own personal experience. If that's not a witness, what is it? That's a personal opinion. Judges can't express personal opinions either. That's why we have something called experts. No, that's Did an expert testify to that, Judge? That's called a First Amendment right. You're considered, so you have a First Amendment right to say whatever the hell you want in a hearing. Is that what you're saying? No, sir. And you can rely upon that when you're spending taxpayer money? No, sir. But that's an isolated case. You, you, well, it can't be an isolated case. I just cited two. Yeah. And well, my colleagues cited others. Yeah. The, you're, you're taking isolated cases. I've had. Well, well, let, well, well let's, well, let's go a little broader than that, Judge. What, what, what is your reversal rate of the hearing officer? Is it in excess of 90 percent? Yes, it's based upon testimony given to me. All right. And, and, and it has to be adjudicated twice before it gets to you, right? That's correct. And only if it's denied does it get to you. So 90 percent of the time, the people under you are wrong. No, I want to be able to cross. Well, it has to be, or you wouldn't be reversing them. They've denied benefits, Judge, and you've reversed their denial. That means that you're hiring some really dumb people to be hearing officers because they're wrong 90% of the time. No, sir. I want to be able to cross-examine the people from Social Security. I'm glad you mentioned cross-examination. Right. I can't tell you how glad I am. Yeah. Because in every other court proceeding, there is someone cross-examining the witnesses, but it's not a judge. It's an attorney, and that's true in misdemeanor crimes, that's true in felony crimes, that's true in civil cases. 
So what I think you need, Judge, is I think you need an advocate and an attorney for the taxpayer in the hearing room. Because I don't want you cross-examining witnesses. If you really think that paddling a child leads to sexual issues, I don't want you doing the cross-examination. And if you really think that 100% of CNAs have been abused and 100% of females in call centers have been abused, I don't want you doing the cross-examination, Judge. Sir, we wear, th we wear three hats. One hat is the Social Security hat. The other hat is the claimant's hat. The other hat is, my, it, it, is the Social Security hat. Where's the expert witness hat? You, you just said you were an expert we, witness. We have an adversary system, and I have the right. It's not an adversary system. There's no advocate for the taxpayer that's in the courtroom. We have a non-adversary system, your, uh, sir. It's a non-adversary well, system, and I have to wear three hats. It can't be too adversarial, or you would not reverse the hearing officer 90% of the time. And some of your colleagues, 99% of the time, they, rever they reverse a hearing officer. And we mistakenly, Judge, thought it was because you were eyeballing the witnesses so you could assess credibility. But we learned from your colleague, Mr. Taylor, that that's not even true. Sir, you don't even have a hearing. You just do it on the paper. Sir, it's not, an it's not eyeballing the witness. I take testimony. I have had here this sheet. Has and who does the cross-examination? It has 186 ailments on it. Who does? Well, that's your document, Mr. No, Cummings. No, no. Mr. Cummings just exposed it. That's your document. No, no. That's I, the the attorney also provides one for me. The attorney for whom? The, for the claimant. That's my point. There is no attorney for the taxpayer. Good. We're going broke, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to tell you a story from Spartanburg real quickly. I had a judge call me. He's apolitical, and he said, "I just sent it someone for calling under people's houses and stealing their copper." And he said, what really struck me as being unusual, Trey, is he is 100% disabled in the back. I want you to think about that, Judge, and I want you to think about one other thing, too. I went on a tour of something called a workability center, where people with special needs value work enough that they go to work every single day. And there was one man who was confined to a wheelchair, had no use of his hands or legs, but his job was to encourage his fellow employees. There is inherent value in work. And one reason your backlog may be so big is because it's so damn easy to get benefits. Not for me. Not for me. I hear every case. I see every person that's ever appeared before me. Everyone. I you know. reverse the hearing officer over 90% of the time, Judge. 90% of the time, the person at the first level is wrong in your judgment, and you are citing your own version of medicine. 100% of the people are abused that if you paddle a little girl, she's going to wind up with sexual issues, despite the fact it's not in the record, Judge. Well, you may be a judge, but you're not God. Well, let me explain to you. If I had this person in front of me that was down below, I could cry, I can examine him on behalf of Social Security, and that would allow the claimant's rep. Well, then why don't your colleagues have hearings? Why do they do it on the paper? If it's that important to eyeball a witness and assess credibility and cross-examine them, why are you doing it on the paper? That's what I said in my, in my remarks here. We need, we need the ability to be able to ha have the witnesses who give any, witness, every, any comment down below should be a fear before me so I can examine them, and they can be cross-examined by the... By the well, uh, I want them being cross-examined by an advocate for the taxpayer, Your Honor, with all due respect, not a judge. Well, that, that, then you need an adversary system, which we don't have today. Mr. Horsford. Well, that, that, then you need an adversary system, which we don't have today. You don't see them up there grilling Supreme Court justices. They're not grilling them because you have a because they on their level. A, a Supreme Court, a true judge, is on the same level as a as as a, as a, as, a, as a senator or a, a representative. He's just a different branch of government. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer, for joining us. It's an honor to have you here today. Um, Justice Scalia, I, w I wanted to follow up on some things you had said in your opening statement uh, along the lines that it is and properly should be a difficult, cumbersome, time-consuming process in our constitutional republic to enact legislation. I think the courts can and should um, uh, play a, a, a significant role in ensuring that that's always the case. The, the court certainly has played a role in the past uh, in cases like INS v. Chatham, in which the court has stepped in and said, you know, notwithstanding the fact that you, Congress, may have found something that 
makes the process of legislating easier or perhaps even more efficient or collegial, uh, you haven't dotted your I's and crossed your T's in the same way that we contemplated under Article 1, right. Section 7, Clause 2, uh, requiring bicameral passage and then presentment. Uh, and, and so this provision is invalid. Um, so uh, let me ask you the, the question, is there also a role for the courts? Can you foresee a role in the, uh, for the courts in other situations in which Congress, some future hypothetical Congress, might do something different that would prove easier and more efficient and more collegial, but perhaps uh, in a way that's, that's antithetical to the Constitution? For instance, let's suppose that Congress, when legislating on the delicate uh, and pressing issue of uh, maintaining the um, proper records in uh, the dog breeding industry. Uh, since we're talking about federal legislation, these would of course be dogs either moving in commerce or taking advantage of some channel or instrumentality of interstate commerce. Uh, since we're talking about federal legislation, these would of course be dogs either moving in commerce or taking advantage of some channel or instrumentality of interstate commerce. Uh, since we're talking about federal legislation, these would of course be dogs either moving in commerce or taking advantage of some channel or instrumentality of interstate commerce. But uh, a, a law in which Congress just passes a law saying we're outsourcing, we're delegating the authority, outsourcing, we're delegating the authority, outsourcing, we're delegating the authority to regulate dog breeding and record keeping for purebred dogs to the board of directors of the American Kennel Club. That passes both houses of Congress. It goes to the president. It's signed into law. And we then have outsourced the regulation of this practice to the American Kennel Club. Is that a situation in which you can anticipate the court might step in? Well, I would step in. I don't know if the court would. I, I, I was, I was the dis, uh, the dissenting vote in in the uh, first case involving. Uh, oh, I, I hate to mention this with my friend Stephen here, since he was on the right. sentencing commission. I thought when when yeah. when Congress created a sentencing commission to decide how many years everybody should spend in jail because presumably Congress didn't have the time to figure it out for themselves and just left it to this commission to do it. I didn't think that that was constitutional. So when Congress created a sentencing commission to decide how many years everybody should spend in jail because presumably Congress didn't have the time to figure it out for themselves and just left it to this commission to do it, I didn't think that that was constitutional. So when Congress created a sentencing commission to decide how many years everybody should spend in jail because presumably Congress didn't have the time to figure it out for themselves and just left it to this commission to do it, I didn't think that that was constitutional. So I, I, I am sure I wouldn't like your, your, your dog breeding body either. But I, 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 can't, I can't speak for the court. I don't know what the court would allow. Senator, of that's course a, you have to make those constitutional decisions. You take the very same oath that I take. The only reason I can look at a, at a federal statute and say I have to disregard this because it, is, it does not comport with the Constitution, the only reason is that I've taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. You take the same oath. So, and, 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 and we give deference to uh, legislation on the assumption that the members of the Senate and of the House have have tried to be uh, faithful to their oath. And if indeed they're, they're, they're not even looking at or even thinking about the constitutionality of it, that, that, uh, uh, that presumption should, should not exist. So yes, of course you, you So in that respect and to that degree, our, our oath to uphold the Constitution, our commitment not to overstep the bounds of federalism, means more than simply doing that which NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel or Wickard v. Filburn might say that we can get away with in court. Well, I think you have to make your, your own decision about constitutionality. In normal times, you follow what the Supreme Court law has said. But we, we don't strike down any of your laws. People sometimes go, the Supreme Court struck. We never strike down your laws, gentlemen. It, it, uh, it, uh, we just ignore them. <laughs> where, 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 where your law does not comport with the Constitution, it seems to be a law but really isn't. And so we ignore it and apply the, the rest of the law, the statute notwithstanding, as, as one of our early cases put it. But it's really, you, you have the first cut and the most important cut. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But an administrative law judge is subordinate to the legislative officers, the senators and all of that. So they'll call them in and start grilling them. What are you doing over here? 
We didn't give you permission to do this, X, Y, and Z. So when you go into a U.S. district court or when you go into any type of superior court nowadays, you're going into an administrative court and you're sitting in front of an administrator and they're enforcing statutes. So right there, they're telling you that any time a judge is enforcing a statute, he's not acting in a judicial capacity. He's acting uh, ministerially. So when you look up the word ministerial, you see what it is. He's following a script. They all follow scripts. It's procedures. This is why I say when you do statutes, it's about form. You don't get to substance and you're dealing with equity.